and round of applause for DJ GPL. Back. back. Yeah. You feeling better? Yeah, kind of. And apparently your, your mom yeah. saw the video and up, con was concerned. I'm, I'm doing all better. <laughs> so she, your mom watches these videos? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She just watches them to just to make sure that my life is Okay. Like, but, I mean, does she know everything that's going on with you? I mean, I, I try to tell her the parts, like, which I'm okay and she's okay with me knowing. Does she know about the pregnancy scare? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> let's get started. All right, uh, again, this is the same as last time. Homework, again, homework five is due on Sunday. Homework project four we do the week following that. As I post on Piazza, on Monday's class will not be here. It'll be on Zoom. And that's the guest speaker from, uh, from Single Store. And then uh, please go vote also, too, for the, when we do the speed run on Wednesday next week. Some people are putting voting for Single Store. We have a whole lecture on Single Store, right? You don't, you don't need to vote for it again, right? We're not going to cover it. Uh, so put, put other systems. And then the final exam will be on the 12th. Uh, and then, as always, we'll post on Piazza as well. We can sign up to be a TA, OK? And then also post for the faculty course evaluations. Uh, and I'll just say, I say things every year. Uh, please be brutally honest. Tell us what sucks about the course, what you don't like, because we actually listen to it and uh, incorporate your feedback in future versions of the, of the course. So in previous semesters, uh, Project 2 used to be like, hey, let's build a concurrent B plus tree. And the students complained that that project was super hard, and 3 and 4 were comparatively easier. So we sort of spread out the load throughout the entire semester. So that's a good example of something we listen to. One year, a student decided to give me a psychological evaluation uh, on myself, uh, and that I did not listen to. So, but uh, if there's other things you don't like about me, please go for it, OK? Any questions about what's remaining for you guys or expected for you guys for the rest of the semester? All right, awesome. Let's jump into this. All right, so today's class, we're going to talk about now distributed databases or distributed analytical database systems. Uh, so before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about how these analytical databases are being used in sort of modern application scenarios or setups. And then that will then help motivate why we want to start using, you know, why we may need a distributed database. Sorry, yes. Her question is, uh, for the final exam, is it comprehensive? No. Uh, but there's things you need to be obviously aware of in order to do answer the questions. Like if, you, if you're brain dead and completely forgot SQL, then you're going to have problems, right? Or if you don't know what a buffer pool is used for, you're going to have problems. But like the core questions will be from the, whatever, the, 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 the lecture before the midterm going forward. And we'll, have, we'll post a study guide up, uh, online. Yes? There will be a practice exam, just like the midterm. Yes. Yes. The question is, is it a full three hours? Uh, like, what do you mean by that? It's like, supposed to be 8.30 to 11.30, so is it expected to be a three-hour exam, or is it? Oh, it's a question. Like, is, is the, will it be twice as long as the midterm? Maybe? No. Oh, so it's going to be an hour and a half. It, it'll be, um, <laughs> you can, so you can take up to three hours as long as you need. Oh, OK. But it's like, did we? Is it going to be double the number of questions on the midterm? No. Okay. Yeah. You know, it, it, we used to keep track of like the time which people were, were turned in the final exam and their grade, similar to the, the midterm. And it used to be like for previous years, like if you if you took the all three hours, you, you typically were in the lower end of the, of the the distribution curve. But in, in recent years, we've had people get like perfect scores. They take the whole three hours. So it's uh, but it's, it's not meant to be twice as hard as the or long as the midterm. Other questions? All right, cool. All right, so again, what I want to talk about first is like what these OLAP systems sort of look like, how they're incorporated in, a, uh, in, applica in, in you know, application environments, and then that will then motivate why we want to be potentially build a or need a distributed database system to do analytics on it. Um, and in most cases, I'll say also, too, the, and th this is purely a conjecture of mine, but like the most people are going to need a, a, a distributed analytical system because you're going to have potentially have a lot of data enriched with not just the data from your applications but from outside sources. Uh, and for those kind of things, a scaled architecture, like an like a, for an OLAP system, makes more sense than maybe in, in an OLTP system. But again, it, as always in databases, it depends. So this is a very common setup right here, uh, where you have this separation in your application between. The OLTP databases and the, the OLAP database. And I'm using OLAP database in a singular form because 
it's sort of like the, the term data warehouse is meant to be like, here's where all your data from your, your front end OTP databases go, uh, and you're gonna run all your analytics on there, right? And again, even though I'm showing that, you know, the, the database drum, you know, there's, there's multiple data drums here, and then one giant data drum for the OLAP system, again, these are just logical views. It could be uh, spread across multiple nodes. So a very common setup is that you have your, your application running with these OTP databases in the front end, and think of these as individual silos, like there's you know, maybe one application writing data to this one, another application writing there, and they don't, they don't really talk to each other. And then you want to combine them together into your giant OLAP system, and you'll use a technique or a method called extract, transform, and load, or ETL. And the idea here is that you're going to extract data from your front-end OTP databases, transform it in some way to clean things up, to put it into like a uniform schema, and then load it into your data warehouse. Right? And the reason why you have to do this is because it, you know, these applications could have been written by different people at different times and using different naming conventions. Right? So maybe the one at the bottom, they have a table of users and they're using, for you know, somebody's first name, they'll use F name or F underscore name. But then in another database, they'll use first underscore name. Right? And as you, we as humans, we know they're, the, they're corresponding to the same thing. But if you just look at the raw schema, they're different. So that's the transform phase. It's sort of, you sort of clean things up. The example I always like to use is Zynga. I think of like Farmville, a lot of data reference, right? But, but they, they would always buy these different uh, game studios and, and buy, you know, buy their, their, their online applications or online games. But then they would leave the, the front end database alone. So whatever the front end database was when they acquired these companies, they just let them do whatever they were doing. But then they obviously wanted to put it into a giant data warehouse. So they would do this ETL process to clean things up because everyone would use sort of different naming conventions. So there's a bunch of tools that, that'll help you do this. Informatica is probably the most famous one of all these. Um, but then all the, all the various database vendors, like Oracle and SQL Server, they all have their own various versions of this, right? So this is how traditionally people did data warehouses starting since like maybe like the 1990s. The current modern trend is a variation of this called, instead of ETL, it's ELT, Attract, uh, Load and Transform. And the idea here is that you're still gonna pull out data from your OTB databases, and then you're still going to load it into your OLAP system, but you're not actually going to transform it before you load it. You just load all the raw files into your, your data warehouse, and then the transform process actually really occurs inside the, the data warehouse itself, because there's going to be a bunch of SQL queries to, to, to convert it and then load it back into as, as more data files, right? DBT is probably the most famous one of all of these. Uh, there's Airbyte. There's a bunch of other ones that, that can do this kind of stuff. And again, you think, okay, well, is it actually really different if you do one versus the other? Yeah. Right? It's, it depends on you know, what, what, how the architecture is set up. But it's not to say that the ones at the top can't do ELT. It's just these ones at the bottom are specifically designed for doing those transformations. Right? So again, now you can see why you could have a, a ton of database or data in your data warehouse because you're getting data from all these other things. Or like things like Fivetran uh, and I think a bunch of the other ones, like they can pull data from outside sources, like say getting weather information you can have a pipeline that pipes that data into your, your, your data warehouse. Then you can enrich the data that you do have. So I'm going to use the term OLAP. Uh, sometimes you'll see these kind of databases referred to as BI or business intelligence databases. Uh, or sometimes you'll see them called decision support systems, DSS. Um, they all pretty much mean the same thing, right? That you're trying to extract new knowledge from the data you've already collected from your front end database system. Right? You're trying to identify things like, here's the, here's, the most, uh, here's the item that most people buy in the city of Pittsburgh in December when the weather goes below some, you know, s some temperature, some degree. Right? Another famous example was uh, Walmart wanted to figure out, this is like early 2000s, they wanted to figure out right before a hurricane occurs and right after a hurricane hits in the south, what does everyone go buy? So that they can, they know, they see this hurricane coming, they start stocking their warehouses near the, the, the stores in the south, but obviously outside of the, the, the danger zone of the, of the hurricane. So then immediately after the hurricane hits, they then send in the trucks with all the supplies that they know people are going to buy. Right? That, that's the idea of what we're trying to do here. Right? We, have, we have the information from all our, from our front end database. Uh, we're trying to then process it and, and then make, help us make decisions. So the, the way we're going to model our database uh, is going to use potentially two different techniques in our OLAP system called a star schema and snowflake schema. And if you ever want to know why snowflake is called snowflake, it's because they support snowflake schemas, right? 
Star schemas were, were bigger in the 90s. Uh, Snowflake is, is a is a the star schema is a subset of what you can do in a Snowflake schema. Snowflake schema is more more general. Uh, but traditionally, doing joins was really expensive before column storage, before all these other query acceleration stuff you can do. Uh, so you would say, oh, I want to do scar schemas. But nowadays, pretty much everyone does, does a Snowflake schema. So there used to be some systems where you couldn't actually load a database unless you put it into uh, star schema form. Now, we're, we don't really talk about data modeling in this, in this class because it's really about how to build a system. I think there's courses in Heinz College that teach you those things. Uh, and we don't teach about normal forms because that, that's a waste of time because nobody actually uses them in the real world. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what these two things look like, and then that'll help us motivate why we want to do efficient joins or why we can use some things with joins that maybe not, maybe not others for certain tables. So this is what a star schema looks like. So the basic idea is that in the middle here, you have what's called a fact table. So this is modeling, say, like, again, just using Walmart example. right? This fact table here is going to be the, every item that anyone ever has ever bought at a store at Walmart, like anything that was scanned along the cash register, or think Amazon, anytime anybody bought something online, the fact table is going to have a single row for every single item. And so you would keep track of like the price and the quantity, keep those as, as attributes directly into the fact table. But then you're going to have all these foreign key references to what are called dimension tables that are going to be out around the outside of the fact table. Right? So just again, it should be sort of obvious. Like for every single item everyone's ever bought, I don't want to store the name and the description of that item over and over again. I want to put it into a dimension table so that I just, you know, anytime I need to get it, I just have a foreign key look up to this. Right? And then now when you're doing a bunch, a bunch of joins, you're basically, just, you know, to do the calculation I was saying before, like find what item people bought uh, right before, right after a hurricane in, in this geographical region. I just rip through my entire fact table and do additional filtering on whether additional dimensions that I have, right? But again, I, for the star schema, I can only have one level of dimension tables going on the outside, right? Because you want to reduce the number of joins you potentially have to do. And so a snowflake schema, you can uh, have any arbitrary amount of, uh, uh, of nesting or leveling. Uh, and this is a term we don't really talk about. It. It's called normalization. So normalization is like splitting a table up into the smallest atomic units. Um, and re to reduce the amount of redundant information you're keeping track of. So like going back here for like the product category, I'm keeping track of like within the, the name of the product and the description, but also the category name and the category description. So like I'll have multiple entries in the same category. I'll just repeat that information over and over again. And the idea is there because you're, you're denormalizing it, putting it into one, one table. I don't have to do a join to go get that. But then the downside, of course, is that if any time I update the name of a category, I got to make sure I update all the tuples. Right, that's basically what normalization, denormalization stuff. That's and we don't and we don't teach those things, uh, but you'll see it in the real world, but not described in terms of like normal forms, which is a whole other almost a theor the theory of how to, to design or model a database. We can ignore that, right? Nobody does it in the real world, right? So again, going back here. So now, if I do the uh, uh, snowflake schema, I can I can normalize out the category information for my products so that now I have a separate category lookup table, right? And now if I want to get the name of a category for a given product, I just do a join against that, right? So this is a lot of what I've already said before. But like in a star schema, the advantage is going to be it's going to run a lot faster, uh, potentially because uh, I don't have to do a bunch of joins. But I'm going to have this, this duplication of data uh, because I've sort of flattened my tables down or combined tables into uh, single tables, right? The snowflake schemas are going to be, uh, require more joins, and potentially the queries are going to be more, more, more difficult to do good planning on. Uh, but again, I have the advantage that I have that isolation of, of the data, or I, I, I'm reducing the number of copies of it, and you know, it's, it sort of makes it easier to reason out what's going on. So when you go in the real world for analytical systems, you will probably see a snowflake schema. Nobody really does star schemas anymore. All right? Again, this is, and this is why snowflake is called snowflake. OK? All right, so with that said, here's the problem we're trying to solve today. An application server comes along against our, our data warehouse, our analytical database system, and they want to do a join on R and S. And say R is the fact table and S is the, uh, is the dimension table, but for now it doesn't matter, right? And I've partitioned my database uh, for these two tables across four different uh, partitions or split across four partitions. doesn't matter whether it's shared disk or, sh or shared nothing at this point. 
right? We still don't have the same problem. We want to do a join. So the, the dumbest way to do a join would be, well, I know I need data at these four partitions. So let me just go copy all of them back to a single node so I can do a join. But obviously that defeats the purpose of having a distributed database, right? Uh, because you know, if my database is, is 10 petabytes and I only have you know, a terabyte of memory on that one partition on one, one node, then I'm gonna read everything from disk from the other nodes, put it into memory, and then now I'm basically a, a single node machine. And I don't get any parallelism, I, I don't get any benefit of having uh, multiple resources. So this sucks, and we want to avoid this. And obviously, we want to do this in such a way that uh, distribute the query across, across these multiple nodes in such a way that we don't have any false positives or false negatives. Right? We, we want to appear as, again, as if we're running on a single node, even though we're not. So for, we've already gone through the snowflake, star, snowflake versus star schema stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about the execution models you could have for a distributed database for doing OLAP stuff. We'll talk a little bit about how we want to do query planning and what changes now when we're in a distributed environment. And again, the TLDR for that is going to be everything's the same. It's just now we need to account for data, not you know the location of data and maybe how it's partitioned. But all the stuff we talked about before, like join ordering, predicate pushdown, projection pushdown, all that is still here. Then we'll talk about how we can actually execute joins. And again, there isn't it's still going to be either sort merge join or hash join in a distributed environment. Most distributed databases are going to do hash joins because um, most of the time you're going to be hash partitioned. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But we may, again, we need to account for where the data is actually located that we need. And if it is partitioned, what key is it partitioned on? Is it the thing we're trying to join on or not? And then we'll finish off doing, again, a quick overview of what cloud database systems look like, specifically in the context of uh, OLAP systems. And... Just, I'll confess now that this is a precursor to what 721 will be uh, next semester. Okay? All right. All right, so the first thing we've got to do is execute queries, obviously. Um, and as I said already, it's basically going to be the same thing as, as we would do in a single node database system. All right, the query plan is going to be most likely a DAG of these physical operators that are going to be moving data from one operator to the next. And whether we're doing a push versus pull in, in, in our processing model, it, it, it doesn't matter. And so now when in our database system, since we know we're distributed, we know that data could be not physically located where the operator is actually running, we have to consider where is the data coming from and where does it need to go next. And this is all stuff we just embed inside of our query plan. Right? So like, again, using table scans, we would know, okay, we need to access this table and if I'm partitioned or not, if yes, where, where, you know, where's the data located? Or if I'm shared disk versus shared nothing, right? is it from a central disk I can get, get the data from? Or do I need to go to a node that has it? For joins, again, we'll cover these in a second. Aggregations and sorting, all this is st still the same. Right? So then the next question is, for a given query plan, how are we going to get the data we need to, to execute or, you know, these operators. And we talked a little bit about this before uh, in the OTP systems about this notion of, do I, am I going to push the query to where the data is actually physically located, or should I pull the data to where I want to run my query? And in the OTP world, the size of the query and the size of the data, uh, the, the, you know, the data is not going to be that, not, 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 not that big. But as I showed in my early example, if my database is 10, 10 petabytes, then maybe I don't want to pull the data to, where, to some node. I may want to send my, my execution request over to where it's, it's located. Then there's also now a question of what happens with the data, the intermediate results that I generate. Right? Should I store them on, on, on my current node and then let someone come, come get it for me? Or can I decide, okay, there, I know where this needs to go. Let me start sending it now. Or should I write it out to a shared disk? So that way if I crash... And if my node crashes, the other node can say, okay, well, I know they processed the, the, the thing I asked it for, but here's, and here, let me go get it from shared disk instead of ha having to restart the entire query. So let's go through these one by one. So again, pushing query to the data. Again, the idea is that we're going to send the query or some portion of it, like a query fragment, to the node that contains the data. And again, this doesn't matter whether it's shared disk or shared nothing because we, we have this notion of logical partitioning. We know that the, you know, the, if the data is at this node that it's not actually located, that, that it has not physically stored it yet, but it's responsible for it, it knows how to go to shared disk and pull it in, 
right? And the advantage of this is that we want to be do as much filtering and processing on the data where it resides before we send it off to the next node, right? Because traditionally, uh, the network was always uh, faster than disk. That is changing a little bit now. Uh, both networks and disk are getting very, very fast. Um, but like, again, just think of like if you had to pay for the network traffic itself in a data center or to go outside a data center, like Amazon charges you when you, when you leave their data center. If I want to do, throw away as much useless data as I can before I send along. Again, it's the same thing as doing projection pushdown or uh, predicate pushdown when we did query planning on a single node. We want to filter things that, you know, as much as possible before we start sending it along. So if we can send some portion of our, of our query to where the data is located, do much processing as we can there before it moves on to the next stage, then we could get a big win there. In some cases, though, you actually may want to pull the data to the query. Again, if it's a shared disk, you may have to, right? Because I can't maybe run my query on the, the shared disk architecture on the object store. Not entirely true. We'll see that in a second. Um, but like, you know, if you can't, there's no compute resources. There's nothing to say, hey, execute some piece of code for me where the data is located, then you have to pull it in. And so the reason why I'm saying the lines get blurred is because in modern cloud systems, like the object stores, uh, you can actually run what looks like queries. Uh, so in S3, in their documentation, you can basically run SQL queries on S3. And it's not full SQL, obviously, and, it, and it's pretty basic. Uh, but like, that's basic, that's, this is basically predicate pushdown that we talked about before, where I say, OK, I have this filter clause. I have this, this filter, my where clause. When I go request the data from the object store, I also pass along that where clause and let it do some filtering so it only sends me back the data that I need instead of copying the whole thing and figuring it out later. Um, so it's not just Amazon. Microsoft also has, also has this for their blob storage uh, that they, you can do something that looks like SQL. And actually, what's really cool about this stuff, too, because we'll, we'll talk about file formats in a second, is that these, these object stores have native support for CSVs and JSON files and Parquet, which is a binary format we'll cover in a second. But like, it's not just like, how do you say this? It's not just like raw text files. You can store things in a, an efficient, compressed binary format, and they'll know how to process it on the fly for you and, and, and run your queries. I don't know whether you can do aggregations. I know you can do filtering. Um, so it's not, like a full, it's not a full database engine down there. You can do whatever you want. But you can clean, you know, can clean some things up before you send it over. I haven't looked this year, but I, I, GCP or Google didn't support this when I, when I looked at it. And this is actually not, not unique to, to these cloud vendors or object stores. Like this is, this is an old idea for shared disk systems before the cloud. Like Oracle Exadata basically has an FPGA on their, uh, on their storage node. So you can send the where clause to the FPGA, and it filters the data as it's coming over the wire to you, uh, which is pretty cool. And obviously, since Oracle controls the whole thing, it's in Oracle's proprietary format. All right. So the lines get blurred when you say whether it's shared disk or, or, or uh, shared nothing. Uh, the shared disk systems, especially in the cloud, are, are getting very good for this kind of stuff. And I don't know whether like I don't know whether Snowflake and others uh, take advantages. I know Redshift does. That's public. All right. So again, this is just repeating what I've already said, but like. We want to push the query to the data. Query goes to this node here. Uh, it recognizes that the, it wants to join, join, join RNS, but RNS are partitioned based on the ID, ID column, which is what we're joining on. So instead of the top node telling the bottom node, send me, whatever you, send me all the, the, the data you have, it sends down the query, plagment, query plan fragment. Because again, there's some metadata we're keeping track of that says, I know, for these tables, they're partitioned on you know, this column. In this case, we're doing range partitioning, and I know what the, the range values for that ID that are, that are located at different nodes are controlled by different nodes. So I'll, I can send my query plan fragment down here to say, hey, by the way, join RNS for this range. And then the, the result gets sent back up to this node, who then just does, does a union of the local result it computed and, and the, the result that it, it, you know, that it got from the other node. Share disk, same idea uh, for, for pulling the query to the data. So in this case here, I, I want to get I, I query shows up at the top node. It knows the bottom node here is responsible for this range. So, but they both got to go to shared disk and get the pages that they, that they need. Uh, so then they do the processing, and then the bottom guy sends his result up to the 
to the, the, the top node. And again, it just unions the result. Right? Okay. So in the example that I've shown here, uh, when you get the result from the other node who process some portion of the query for you, uh, that node is just going to store it in, in this buffer pool. Right? That way, if, if it runs out of memory because you're getting too much data from the other guy, it just spills the disk until you can combine the result and, and send it back. Now, in some cases, for some queries, you actually can just immediately start sending the data back out to the client as it comes in. Uh, but in some cases, if there's another stage in the query plan, you may need to store it locally and then send along the next stage. You just can't immediately send it out. Um, and then the, you know, in, in, the, in the last lecture, we made a big deal about making sure that, like, about crash recovery, for, uh, you know, doing two-phase commit across the different nodes, so that if we want to make a change, that everyone agrees that this is going to happen. Um, but we don't really, we're not really worried about that in, in this world because we're not making changes to the database. Right? We're just doing some kind of read-only select query that's trying to get new data. Um, but then the, the challenge is now, what happens if my query is going to run for a really long time? Right? Think hours. Uh, days, less common now, but in the old days, certainly this was an issue. Um, but you know, if my query is going to run for five hours, but then after hour three, the whole, you know, one node goes down, what happens? Right? If I'm just storing things in, my, you know, in an ephemeral cache in my buffer pool, then, and it's written to my local disk at the node, again, whether it's shared disk or, or shared nothing, then the whole query has to restart. Right? So there's another notion of fault tolerance for, for, for databases, uh, but it's really about query fault tolerance. Meaning, if my query is being spread across multiple machines, all processing in parallel, that I want to avoid the issue of one node going down, taking the whole thing, uh, and you know, crashing the whole query and having to restart. Um, and again, like this is this is nothing to do with whether the, the data is replicated or not, right? It's it, you wouldn't really necessarily want to maybe replicate the result at different nodes or have two nodes compute the same answer, so that you can you know, in case one of them goes down, because that'd be really inefficient. So we need a better way to record the intermediate results as our query runs so that if there is a crash, one of the nodes does go down, uh, then we don't have to restart the whole thing. All right? And so the idea is what we're going to do here is that we just need a place that where we can store data for the query while it's running so, so that if one node goes down, we can go pick up those results. What can we use for that? The shared disk, right? Because that thing's not going anywhere. Amazon... S3 going down would be, I mean, it does go down, but it would be take, take the entire internet down, right? Uh, so we can just use a shared disk storage as a way to keep like a, almost like a checkpoint for our queries while they're running. So again, same setup here. I, I want to run this query. Uh, I asked the guy, bottom guy here to do the join. And then instead of maybe sending the result immediately back up to the node there, I'm going to write it to my object store or write it to my shared disk. And then tell the upside guy up, you know, tell the guy up there, like, or you would coordinate this ahead of time. Hey, by the way, you asked me to run this query plan, a query plan fragment. Here, here's the location on shared disk where you can go get my result. So now, if this guy crashes, uh, then the other node can just retrieve that result uh, and pick up where it left off. Now, there's a bunch of coordination going on about like, okay, this node went down. Let me spin up another node in Kubernetes or whatever you're using to then replace it. Uh, but I don't need to recompute everything that it actually did. Who here has heard of, heard of a Hadoop? All right, less than half. Uh, so, or Matt Reduce, who here has heard of Matt Reduce? Okay, same people. All right. So, in the in the two thousands, Google came out with this paper in two thousand four ish uh, for this technique called Matt Reduce. It's basically a distributed programming uh, paradigm, a framework where you write these specialized map and reduce functions that allow you to do uh, you know, data processing. But it was, it was basically arbitrary Java code, uh, or at least in Hoopdoop it was. And in their implementation, because they were assuming you're running on cheap hardware, like thinking think thousands of, of you know, single unit uh, servers, they would do this checkpointing after every single uh, sort of map reduce phase. Uh, which, and they would duplicate it like three or four times. It would be super expensive. So in my example here, I'm showing like, oh yeah, I run this, run this join, and then all the results get back sent back to the shared disk. Um, they would do that for everything. 
but you can be actually a bit smarter about it and recognize that, like, okay, well, maybe I'm gonna do this join and then immediately do something else right after, but I can do that locally on my node, so maybe I don't need to send out the result to the, the shared disk. So in, in modern systems, um, they'll do this kind of checkpointing similar to what Hadoop has, was doing to avoid having to restart the entire query if there's a failure, but they're not like checkpointing like, like blindly for every single step as you would do in, in MapReduce. There's a, we can go, I can, I can go for a long tirade about problems with MapReduce. Uh, we, we, we don't, we're not out of time, so let's skip it. Um, basically, nobody runs MapReduce now anyway, right? Nobody runs Hadoop. That's all been deprecated. And even things like, oh, at least, like, as I was saying, like Hadoop, it was, you write raw Java functions uh, for, to, to, you know, or Java code to process data as if it was a query. People realized that was a bad idea, so then they put SQL on top of it with this thing called Hive, which is invented by Facebook, and then that's a terrible idea too, because you're basically converting SQL queries into MapReduce jobs. So all the crap, crappy problems you have of MapReduce, like inefficient architecture, you inherit even though now you're at least writing in SQL. And then, then they, everybody realized that was a bad idea, so then there's things like Presto or Trino, which we'll cover in a second, that are like uh, more efficient replacements for running analytical queries on top of like shared disk storage. All right. But this query checkpointing that have fault tolerance, uh, that is one thing that came out of like the MapReduce world that has permeated throughout uh, in distributed databases, distributed relational databases. All right, for query planning, again, it's all the stuff we talked about before. We still want to do projection pushdown, predicate pushdown. We still need to figure out the optimal join ordering. Again, all of that doesn't go away. But now what we need to do is consider, again, where data is actually physically located and also the network transfer costs. Because again, that's as equivalent to like reading something from disk. I gotta send things over memory, or sorry, send, send, send things over the network. That doesn't come for free. There's a cost to that. And so there are some systems uh, like DB2, for example. I know when the when the data system boots up and it knows that it's in a distributed uh, configuration, it actually runs a bunch of micro benchmarks, basically you know running like you know, sending packets over the wire to the different nodes and measuring the latency. And then it uses that, those measurements to, to as, as values in its cost model to decide you know, how expensive is something versus you know, reading from local from disk or sending, you know, reading from memory. So I would say that that's, that's the right way to do it. Most systems just sort of have a hard-coded value to say, here's how much it costs to send a byte over the network or, or a megabyte over the network. Um, but of course, those, uh, the network connections aren't always symmetrical. So doing some kind of micro-benchmarking like TP2 does is the right way to go. All right, so the question is now, what are we actually going to send between the different nodes to tell them to do work on behalf of our distributed query? So the most common approach is to send physical operators. And this is basically, again, the, the same thing you would get in parallel execution on your, on your single node database system. You would break up your query plan into plan fragments and then distribute them amongst the nodes. And you may annotate it with information about where the data is coming from and where, where it needs to go next. Right, but but the, what you're sending to the different nodes are these physical plans, because the, the or physical operators, because the plan's already been decided by some kind of centralized coordinator or centralized optimizer. And most systems are going are to use this approach. A, an alternative is that you take the output of a query optimizer that's running in like a centralized coordinator, right? That's going to be physical operators, and then you break that up into the fragments that you want to send to different nodes. But then you, rev you revert or reverse those, those physical operators back to SQL, and then you send SQL to the different nodes. And the idea here is that you've already done some of this global optimization uh, of figuring out you know, what query plan fragments need to execute on what nodes. But then rather than deciding for that node, here's exactly the query plan I want, I want you to run, you give them SQL, which they can then now you know, parse and optimize locally because they may, may make a, a better decision on the node that they're running on based on what they see in the data that they do have. So the idea is, again, instead of having a global view or try to maintain a global view of how to optimize the system, you get far enough to say, okay, guys, here's the work I want you to do, but then they can each make their own local decision. So this is rare. Very few systems do this. Uh, single store, I, I think they still do this. I don't, I don't think they would have changed, but they do this. And then Vitesse is a... Um, it's not really an analytical database system, but it, it is a distributed system. Um, it's a uh, sort of sharding middleware for MySQL that was uh, developed by YouTube. 
right? So YouTube runs off MySQL. Um, and because the nodes that they're talking to are all just MySQL nodes, right? MySQL can't take in a physical plan. They got to convert it back to SQL and then send it to the send it to the node. And then that node again does all the parsing and optimizing locally. All right. So the idea is like this: if you want to send uh, SQL queries, so this is the join we had before in our catalog. We keep track of, of here's the the range partition we have for our database for for our tables. So we take the I take the original query, uh, and then we figure out, OK, here's, here's the data I need, I need to access. And then I modify the query now to include the, the join clause for the data that, that's local to it. Right? And then this node will get that query, run it through the same optimization pass that, that it did before. Right? And the idea here is, again, maybe the, the centralized view doesn't have the uh, complete view or up-to-date view of what the statistics are in the, in the database or at, at each node. And then the again the, there'll be some kind of centralized coordinator that knows how to union results and put things back together at the end. So I, I think I, I think it's a clever idea. Uh, reversing from physical plan back to SQL is not is non-trivial, uh, and most people don't don't do this. And when you think about it too, in an OLAP system, uh, oftentimes the you know the data is not changing that often. There's ways to handle that uh, we, we can cover later, but like. So the, it, it, it's not all, the idea that every node might have a better view of what the data looks like versus the, the global view, it doesn't always hold up. Yes? Why do you have to retransform it into SQL? Why can't you just send a SQL plan and then the local node uh, then reruns the optimization? Yeah, to his point. So, so why do you have to send SQL? Why couldn't you send, say, the physical plan or the logical plan, then, then just have their query optimizer just optimize that, yeah. right? Because then you need to build a separate code now for the optimizer to take in that as input and like inject all the sort of the internal metadata about the search process. It's it's it's, a, it's weird. It's not now people usually write write their optimizers, right? But you should like you should ideally you want your optimizer to be able to stop, dump out its state, and then load it back in. Very few systems can do that, right? Think like it's like rebuilding the stack of a search tree. You'd have to suck all that out and then inject it back in. You can do it. It's just additional engineering. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about how we actually want to execute our joins. So the again, as I said before, we're still going to be either doing hash join or sort merge join, nested loop join if you're really unlucky, uh, but. Uh, you know, the the, the trade-offs between those two approaches are still the same, even in a distributed environment. And as I said before, we could just try to put all our data that's called, spread across different nodes onto a single node and then do the join there, that it would work and it wouldn't have any false negatives because uh, we're guaranteed that the data you know, we're, we're trying to join will, will be located with each other. But obviously, that's not realistic. Right? And you know, you're not, unlikely that a single node can handle all your data. So the way we're going to do this is that to join two tables R and S, we need to get the the idea is to get the data that we're trying to join from the two tables on the same node based on the join key, regardless of how the data has been either replicated or partitioned. And so we're going to go through four scenarios, going from like best to worst, uh, and we're going to see how the you know basically if the data isn't in the isn't partitioned or placed in the way that, that's, that you need for the query, the database system is going to have to move it around. And this is all transparent to you as the application developer, as the user writing the query. You don't know where the, how, how the data is getting where it needs to go. But obviously, if we're actually building the system, we need to care about these things. And the key thing we need to avoid is false negatives, because we don't want to you know, join like R and S looking you know, and where there is a join, or there is two tuples that should match on a given join key values. But because they're physically located on different nodes, you know, we're going to get incorrect results for this. Okay? So again, we're going to go through four scenarios. Uh, and I would say everything I'm going to talk about here is, again, the same for whether it's shared disk or shared nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So best case scenario is when one of the tables we want to join on is replicated at every node. Again, 
you can have this in your database system. You can have some tables are partitioned and some tables are replicated. Going back to that snowflake schema stuff before, those dimension tables are usually pretty small relative to the fact table. The fact table is going to be huge. Like I think any, every item anyone, anyone's ever bought from Amazon, it has to be billions if not trillions, right? But your dimension tables, think of things like zip code. It's what, 40,000 zip codes in the US? Post office changes them four times a year. So you can take that 40,000 tuple table and you can replicate that on every single node as a dimension table. So now when you're doing a join against your fact table, the data is just right there to do the join, right? So all you need to do now in this scenario here, again, so if I want to join R and S on ID, S is replicated everywhere. We partition R based on the ID. So each node just does its local join and then this node will send its result to this other node, who then just unions the results. You don't actually need to look at the results for this example here, because you know that the, it's non-overlapping -over partitions for, I, for, the, for R. So I just literally concatenate the byte buffers on top of each other and then send that back to the client. Right? So this is, this is the best case scenario because I did no data transfer in order to compute the join. And then obviously to, to, the, I have to send the result, but like, depends on the selectivity or whatever, whatever it is I'm trying to join on. Like this is the bare minimum I need to send over to process this query. So if your tables aren't replicated, then it's basically the same thing. Like, but if the two tables are partitioned on the same attributes as you're trying to join on. So in this case here, again, I want to join RNS on the ID field. And then it just so happens that the range partitions for RNS on e in each partition are exactly the same. So now, again, I, I have each node process its local join in parallel. Uh, and then this other node sends the result to the other guy, concatenate the results, and send it back to the client. All right? So this is, this is nice, but it doesn't always happen. You know, it, it's, it's not always the case that you're going to be exactly partitioned on the, uh, on the thing you want to join on. And we're not going to talk about how you actually pick the partitioning key, but that's a whole other problem. Like that's been shown to be NP hard, right? For an arbitrary set of queries, an arbitrary set of attributes you could partition on, figuring out the ideal partitioning scheme for your table, for your tables is, is, is non-trivial. And of course, like some cases, maybe you get for 99% of the queries, you, you get this nice layout like this. But of course, there's going to be some query that shows up where it isn't joining on the partition key. So that's the third scenario. So in this case here, the R table is partitioned on ID, but now my S table is partitioned on value, some other attribute, right? And so if I just do the join on the local data here, again, I, I can end up with false negatives because the thing, you know, if there's some ID equals one, it may be on this other node here. I don't know that, right? Because I partitioned it on a, a, a different key or different attribute. So when this occurs, you have to do what is called a broadcast where you have the, you're basically reorganizing the, one of the tables. And so you're going to take all the, uh, the, the values of S for some ID within some range, and you're going to send it over to that partition. Uh, sorry, I take it back. You're going, to, you're going to basically send whatever data you have here uh, from S, you're going to send that to every other node that's involved in the join. So now basically S is, is going to be replicated, just as it was in the first scenario, at every, every single node. Right, so again, you, the, idea is, the reason why it's called a broadcast is like you're saying, hey, guys, here's the values I have for this table, and everyone gets a copy of it now. And again, you can do this if it's like a dimension table that's going to be much smaller than, than, than the fact table. So sometimes you'll see this in the literature or in like documentation. They'll call this a broadcast join. And it really just means that it's, they're doing this step to send the data around. Uh, and they'll usually say that it's a broadcast hash join or broadcast sort merge join. It's just they have this extra step. Yes? Uh, if you're going to do this anyway, why not go back to scenario one? Question, if you're going to do this anyway, why not go back to scenario one? I mean, this will put you into scenario one. Uh, it may be the case that, there's, that someone picked, I want to partition on value, uh, because I have most of my queries are going to want to do a join in value or do look up some values. It just happened for this one query, the data is not in the layout that I want, so I've got to move things around. Um, in other times, uh, we'll talk about data lakes in a second or lake houses. In that world, you are just loading a bunch of data files in, 
and you're not doing any reorganization to do any partitioning of them. So you basically have to look through the, the, the file and then say, okay, well, here's the data that I'm seeing. Do I want to partition it and send it around or do I want to broadcast it and send it around? Right? Yeah, that, that, I, I didn't really say this ahead of time. This is, so what we're talking about here so far is, is what we call sort of managed storage, where as I, it's literally like me calling insert queries into the database, and the data says, oh, I know what this data is, I know what table this is, and they can decide how to, how to move things around. In the data lake world, you don't have full control. We'll, we'll cover that in a second. Yes? So, Professor, if there are n nodes, how many uh, connection producers or how many? Everyone. So his question is, if you have n nodes, are you, is every other node sending to the n minus 1 nodes? Yes. You're broadcasting everything you have to everyone else. Yes? Yeah, his statement is, uh, instead of doing the n-squared broadcast, why not just have all the nodes pick this one guy, everyone sends s, and then it sends it out. Yep. You could do that. Right? The big idea is that we're, we're basically replicating s after it wasn't replicated. And that's the broadcast phase. How you actually do that depends on implementation. His mom's calling, probably. Anyway. Um, okay, I, and then we do, yeah, sorry. So in a shared nothing in, uh, scheme, like, what happens if when you combine, like, tables and each of those nodes, like, just run out of memory, or, sorry, run out of storage? I'm sorry, what, in a, it's in, in a shared disk system. Shared, no, shared nothing. Shared nothing, you combine, you, you com combine, like, a bunch of stuff into a single node, but, like. Wait, 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 Okay, so say the first one, memory. If I run out of memory, again, the iterate results, this is getting, it's going to get staged in my buffer pool. It just gets written out to the disk, yeah. and then I pay that, that cost of swapping it back in, right? right. Like that's, that's, yeah. uh, that's just all the stuff we did before, right? The other one is like, what if I run out of disk? Yeah. Well, that's the same thing as a single node. If I run out of disk, I crash. There's nothing you can do, okay. right? You can't, you can't, like... Is there not a way to like sort of like hop around the, or like have instead of R... Um, R from 1 to 100, like sort of hop around the nodes and try and join with them and sort of aggregate the, aggregate the, the result in some way. Your, qu your statement is, could, is there a way to like... So instead of sent like... Uh, yeah. it, basically saying like if I recognize that if I put everything on a single node here, I'll run out of memory or run out of disk. So let me try to just rebalance things on the fly. Uh, no, like so like, instead like Okay, we we can come back to you. Right. Yes. Well, I think like it's kind of like similar to that. And like when you if you pull like S or and R, both are too big for an individual node's disk. Yes. Is there a way to break S and R up in such a way that you can perform the join across yeah. the different nodes by only loading a part of S and a part of R at a given time? Uh, uh, yeah. So could you? So the statement is, uh, if R and S are too big to. The partitions of RNS are too big to put on a single node. Could you basically, like, I'm just like a streaming thing where you bring in some of it, and that way you can do a portion of the join that you have so far. So, again, just think going back to our hash join example before. I got to build the, the, the hash table on the, the build side of the join. So, I need to build that first. If that, if I, that one I, I can stream, right? And then when I do my, uh, my probe, same thing. I can stream the data in and do that incrementally. So, yeah, you can do that. So yeah, I'm showing this sort of at a high level, like, okay, you're going to move data around. Uh, it's not like you do this step and then you can do the join, although I'm showing that in, in PowerPoint. But like, again, using hash join example, I could, I could build a hash table on, on, on R, and then as, uh, as I'm getting with the, 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 the tuples from S are coming over the network, then I do the probe in, 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 you know, and, then, and, then, you know, and then send out the intermediate result somewhere. And then I go back and get more as I bring things in. Yes. It's just the same idea as on a single node system. You do the same thing. Right? You wouldn't, again, going back to single node for, for a hash join, I wouldn't, uh, on, on, the, on the probe side, I wouldn't bring everything into 
to memory, although some systems do that, bring everything to memory and then do the probe. I can do it in either, you know, get next and get, get a batch of things. Okay. All right, and then the worst case scenario is when the both tables are not partitioned on the join key. And so now in this case here, I got to reorganize. I'm basically sending out an, a complete copy of the database uh, across, across nodes. And now in this case here, since we're not going to replicate the two tables, uh, we don't need, need to do the n squared broadcast. We know where, where data needs to actually go. It's basically like dumping the table out and then loading it back in, but with, this time with a different partitioning key. Right? So R is partition on N, S is partition on value, but I need IDs. So I'm going to send all the data for some range of R ID over there. Uh, same thing for, for R over here. And then I can send over S for both of them. And then now the data is, is in the form that I need, right? Where I'm, I'm guaranteed there's no false negatives. Because all if I do my join, it's all, all going to be local for the, for the IDs. Everyone does their join locally. And then we ship back the result and produce the final answer. Yes? What can we do with our previous scenario where we just move around one set of the data, like broadcast one set of the data across all the desks and then do your regular join based on the IDs? This question is why can't you broadcast one of the tables uh, across all the disks and just do the join on regular IDs? Yeah, like you know, read the ID internal within each single node and then do your join and then merge all the results together. Uh, but I, I, st I still need to get the, like, I still need to get all the, I, the, the S values for a given ID over here. So I, I, when I do my join, like, you know, I, I, I don't end up missing something that is over here because I didn't bring it over. Well, okay, so if we just take S, uh, if we just broadcast the entire S table. But say S is 10 petabytes. Well, what about the other table? Both of them are 10 petabytes, so we're not going to do anything. But, but like, but, but, but in this case here, I'm sending only a partition of the data to the other nodes, right? I don't have to put, like, are you proposing to get S in its entirety replicated on every single node? Right. I mean, we could do any sort of streaming to partition a node. Sure. Well. So. Like, my question is, why do we need to reorganize it? So, so in, if you, so how's this? This is actually would be, would be more efficient than that because if you're broadcasting to everyone, mm -hmm. then like say again using S as an example, then I'm sending potentially IDs of, of or values of S where the ID is never going to match anything here in R. So why send that data? Well, if you reorganize it, don't you have to read everything once to reorganize it and then do this reading? So you're sort of moving the table twice. Yeah, but like I don't, I don't. You're moving the table. Tw no, you're. Oh, I see. So you're. So each single node is going to send their internal corresponding ID to that. Same Correct. Table. Yes. Because I. Because. Because yeah. Because and again, I can do this because it's SQL. I know what the join clause is. I know what my data looks like. I therefore I know I know where it needs to go. Right, yeah. So just like in the shuffle join, or sorry, in the broadcast join, you'll see this sometimes called shuffle join, and again, it's still doing hash join underneath the covers typically. It just they'll, they'll, they'll say it's a shuffle hash join. Or, or often, but sometimes it, they might just say it's a shuffle join, but it's really a shuffle hash, hash join doing this extra step. Right? So in this example here for this query, it's a select star, meaning I'm getting all, I want all the columns from R and all the columns from S. Sorry, yes? I guess I've had the opposite question. Like, why, why do you broadcast in scenario three instead of distribute? Our question is, why do you broadcast versus a shuffle? Because uh, it depends on the size of, of, of the table, right? Um, right, so in this example here, they're all select star queries. So I need the columns of R and S, all right? Uh, so therefore, I have to send all the data over. You can do basically some kind of projection pushdown to say, okay, well, I only, I'm only going to send the actual columns I actually need. Uh, and this technique is what is sometimes called a semi-join. Semi so the SQL standard doesn't define what a, a semi-join. Uh, some systems actually have this in, in their syntax, like an explicit semi-join like clause, like inner join or outer join. Um, and the basic idea is here is that instead of sending over the uh, the actual all the data from the columns that match during the tuple, thinking like if it was on a single node, um, I'm just going to send over the 
uh, the bare minimum of the data I need to actually do the join. Again, this is basically just like a projection pushdown, but it, in, for whatever reason, they explicitly call it a, uh, a semi-join. So in this case here, I'm doing a, uh, a join in RNS like before, um, but I only want RID, and I, uh, I, only, I only want to do matches where RID is not null. So now, again, if I'm split up across two, two nodes like this, uh, instead of sending all of S over to, to R to do a join, instead I'll, uh, or likewise for R, uh, instead, what I can do is just send, here's the, here's the IDs that could match, and you send it over to, to the two of them. And this is equivalent to re basically rewriting the query as with a select one, basically saying, hey, for this given RID, something does match. I'm not telling you what, what the rest of the tuple is. I'm just saying, like, something is here. Again, just think of, like, I'm, it's, it's, it's doing the join, but instead of getting back the result, you're just getting back, like, a true false to say here's or the set of IDs that did match. And again, some systems uh, will uh, have explicit clauses for this. Okay. Yeah, right. So this is like, yeah, you send IDs, yada, yada. So, okay. All right. So in the meantime, I want to talk about cloud systems. Um, and again, there's, there's, a lot more, uh, there's a lot more activity, at least in the marketplace, for uh, anal analytical systems running on the cloud. And part of it has to do with like chasing after all that you know, the Snowflake money and the Snowflake IPO. And Databricks is, will be there pretty soon. Um, so in, in, in the cloud systems, they're going to offer what is called Database as a Service, or abbreviated DBAAS. Um, and the idea here is that they're going to provide you with a, a managed database system environment, meaning, like, instead of you going allocating an EC2 instance, downloading MySQL, Postgres, whatever you want, and, and running that locally, and you managing that entire that, that whole VM, plus along with storage and backup and recovery and all that stuff. Uh, instead, they'll provide you with just a URL where you can connect your application to and uh, you know, interact with the database system. So you can't SSH into the box because that's all hidden from you. But for most people, who cares? Uh, and instead, they'll, they're going to manage all, everything, everything for you. Right? And as we said before, a lot of the times that with, between shared disks and shared, and shared nothing systems, all that gets uh, looks underneath the covers. A lot of that looks looks sort of look, looks the same. So there's two ways to run basically a cloud database system. Um, the first is what called again what I was sort of said before a managed database system where they basically took some off the shelf software like Postgres, MySQL, and it's, again instead of you running an EC2, they're going to run an EC2 for you, and they'll have some management interface in, in, in front of it. And they'll, they'll handle backups and snapshots and recovery and all that kind of stuff, right? But for the most part, it's, it's going to be exactly the same as, as you would download and run, run locally. And this means that the, the database system itself is not going to be aware that it's running in a cloud environment. I mean, running in a, uh, in a disaggregated architecture, like with, with, with shared disk. And this is what most vendors do, less so in, 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 in more recently, but... Most of the time when you see like, hey, here's like this hot open source project that has like based on a startup, and then you can download it off GitHub, and then soon after they have their cloud version of it, this is typically what, the, what they're doing. They're just taking it, and they're going to run it, run it for you. There's another category of systems called cloud, what I'll call cloud-native systems, and this is not a scientific term. This is sort of what people mean when you say cloud-native cloud database, where the, the database system has been built from the ground up or been modified significantly to be aware that it's running in a cloud environment, specifically with shared disk. Uh, and it can take advantage of all the sort of flexibility and the scalability and elasticity of, of a, of a cloud-native system or a, a cloud-based database system. So Snowflake probably was the first in this space. Uh, maybe. Uh, BigQuery came up with an internal project called Dremel that started like 2006. Uh, Snowflake is 2012-ish, 13. But Snowflake is the one that really made this, this, this architecture popular, right? And so if you have now a, uh, you're, you're running in the cloud, one of the things you can do is, is support what's called a serverless database system. So this seems like a weird thing to, to attach to a database system is to say, like, because obviously you need servers to run it, right? And so what they really mean is that you're not going to provision servers ahead of time for each customer, for each tenant, and that if it's ever the case where a, 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 a tenant becomes idle, meaning they don't run any queries, you actually can turn off the compute nodes uh, or, the, or, the, or those resources for the system 
And then when they come back later and run a query, you spin all that back up. So it's, it's like you're turning machines off for them uh, and not charging them for the, those compute resources. But then they, the, the data system, the database system is always available. So assuming we're on like a, like a shared everything system, we allocate some EC2 node, right? We, you know, we have memory, we have a disk, we have a CPU, and say the application's running queries on it, that, that's just fine, right? But then let's say like the application goes away, right? Because someone falls asleep, they're not running any queries, right? Nothing's happening. And in this environment, you pay for this, for this node, right? Because this basically, just like in BusTub, uh, there's a while loop where this thing's spinning waiting for incoming requests. And so you don't know when the requests are going to come, come along, so you always have to be waiting. But now you're just, you're just burning idle, cy idle cycles. So in a service environment, again, assuming that it's shared disk, what you can do is you just run the queries like before, fetch things from the shared disk as needed. But then when people go away, you flush out the contents of the buffer pool and the page table to storage. Basically, you take a snapshot of your, of your page table uh, that's, you know, that's in memory, keep track of what pages there are and, and any dirty pages, you write all that out to storage. Then you go ahead and kill this thing. The data is still there, right? Because it's still on shared disk, everything's fine. And then when people, when the, and you're paying less for that, and then when the application server wakes up, sends a query, it's as if the system's booting up for the first time, but instead of having a, uh, no information on what was in the page table, you go fetch that, that, that information back in and you sort of bootstrap the system to say, here's what the state of the system was before I shut down. So in my example here, I'm showing like we're killing the compute node entirely. Uh, there are some systems where it's a multi-tenant setup where it's the same uh, one sort of instance of the database system is supporting multiple customers. So all you need to do now is, is look in the buffer pool and figure out for this customer that I know is idle, let me write out its results. But the, the thing is still running. And so there's a bunch of databases uh, that are now sort of in this, uh, that support what are called serverless databases like this. Um, Amazon took Postgres and MySQL and rewrote it for this thing called Aurora. They have a serverless system. Fauna is, is a uh, serverless database that has portions of Cassandra in it, um, but everything, a lot of it's written from scratch. Neon is probably, the, probably one of the more famous ones for Postgres, where they took Postgres, ripped out the bottom half, similar to what Amazon did for Aurora, and then reconfigured it to be you know, based, based on our shared disk architecture, right? And PlanetScale and Cockroach have their own, own things. PlanetScale is the commercial version of a test, the thing I said before that came out of YouTube. It's the YouTube guys basically went and forked a company, right? All right, so the other thing we talked about and mentioned before is this, there are these data lakes. And this is sort of the modern buzzword now to describe basically people using an object store as a data warehouse instead of just having, the, you know, the, you know, server managed proprietary storage, or uh, as before. So it's typically, or almost always, going to be a shared disk architecture, right? Um, but in, in a in a traditional data warehouse, what would happen is, and if I want to load any data into my data warehouse, I got to call create table uh, that then updates the catalog, and then I have to insert a bunch of data. But that's all going to be going through this compute node that's con that, that's controlled by the database system. So it's going to know, like, here's the data that you're trying to insert in this table. It's going to go to this location on storage, right? And it has to look at the catalog and figure out where to write stuff. But, and then any query can, can do the same thing. But in a data lake architecture, the idea here is that I don't have the, the database system be the gatekeeper for all new data coming in. Instead, I have this, this, this object store where any application can start writing a bunch of files in there. And they can put in... CSV files, JSON files, Parquet, Orc, which cover in a second. Like they just start throwing whatever data that they want into this object store. I have to update some catalog somehow to keep track of it. And then now when a select query comes along uh, on this node, we look in this catalog and figure out what was there. Uh, and then we know how to go get the data that, that we actually need. Again, the idea here is we want to remove the gatekeeper, the data system as being the gatekeeper, and let anybody write stuff in here. And then we'll go figure out what, what's actually in it when we run, when we run queries. So this goes back to actually what we said in the beginning about this extract transform load versus versus extract load transform. This is that setup here where anybody can just take, you know, get data from whatever front end application and shove it into S3 as a bunch of files, and then someone's also going to come along and clean things up and figure out how, how to make sense of it. So there's a bunch of people in this space. 
Databricks is probably at the forefront, at least in marketing, talking about this. And they have a, the term of this, this idea that like, it's, yes, there's, there's an object store, but then the, you have this execution engine and this catalog infrastructure on top of it. They, they would call that the lake house, like a, you know, a play on the words of a data warehouse. Right? It's basically what I'm describing here. So the Databricks has this, and everyone has their own, own variation of it. Uh, Redshift actually didn't start off being a cloud native system. Like it was a fork of Park Cell, which is a fork of Postgres. It was very much a shared nothing system. And they've, over time, they've, they've rewritten a lot of it to be shared disk and look very similar to this, this architecture here. All right, so the last thing I'll talk about is will be a segue into what 721 will be about if you continue on with this stuff. Um, but one very interesting trend we've seen in, in databases in the last decade is that instead of having these giant monolithic database systems where everything is written by the same vendor or same, same group organization, like in, inside the system itself, the last couple of years, people have been breaking off components of the system and have them being standalone services that you can then connect together in some way to build a larger da you know, data, data, database system, a data warehouse system. Essentially, sort of like the, the lake house stuff that I'm talking about here, right? And what's interesting about this is that a lot of times these components that, that people are building, they're not being built by a database system vendor, which is traditionally how database system software has been written for, for decades, right? Instead, you have these big tech companies, or in some cases, even smaller startups, where they have some need to, for some, some piece of a database system, and they end up building it, open sourcing it, and other people pick up and start using it. And even again, the, 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 that company who's, who's building that piece of software, they don't make their money with that software. They make their money doing something else. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. So like Facebook is building, has this open source execution engine. Facebook is not a database company, but they need the execution engine for their own internal uh, you know, needs, but then they open source it. Um, actually, Facebook has put out a lot of good software in, in the, the last decade or so in, in the context of databases. Um, so we'll go through a bunch of the examples. So like the idea here is that you can now build, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you want to build a new database system, you don't have to build everything from scratch anymore or take, or take Postgres or ClickHouse and fork that and then try to modify that specifically. You can take these different, different components and start putting them together. And so what I mean by com commoditization is that the... What made like Snowflake unique ten years ago is not really uh, is, is not really significant anymore because everyone has it. Like everyone has a vectorized query engine these days, or everyone's going to be using a column store. The thing that matters the most now is like the user experience, the front end stuff, the the query optimizer certainly. Right. So you you can you can put these things together and make a system, but then like to differentiate yourself, you'd have to mostly focus on the front end stuff. Right, actually, just using DuckDB as an example. DuckDB is an amazing piece of software, but the core ideas are, are you know, well-known and not new. It's just they put it in a great form factor that you can run anywhere and, and connect it to like pandas and things like that. But that's not the core database engine stuff. That's all like the user experience stuff. All right, so catalogs we talked about. Again, this is how we're going to keep track of what data is, uh, you know, we have, like where our files are located on storage, what the scheme is, and so forth. Um, the, probably the most famous sort of standalone catalog system is this thing called H Catalog that came out of Facebook, came out of the Hive project, right? The H stands for Hive or Hadoop. Um, and again, the idea here is that I can write a bunch of th files in S3, and then I update H Catalog and say, hey, by the way, here's these files that I have, and here's the schema. And then maybe some basic statistical information about what's in them, right? Because those files sometimes can record that. And then certainly all the cloud vendors will sell you something as well. Uh, Databricks has their thing called Unity. Um, it's not open source, but they all provide some mechanism to make sense of what data you have in, in, your, in your lake house. Query optimizers we've talked about. Again, this is the hardest part of building a database system. Uh, and to no surprise, most people don't want to build it themselves. So instead, there are at least two that I know about open source projects where like, these are just meant to be standalone opt query optimization as a service. CalSite is probably the most famous one. Um, that was a, there was a, a data system in the 2000s called LucidDB. I think it was European. Uh, they were a startup. They failed. Uh, the company failed. And then they, for whatever reason, they pulled out the query optimizer they built and then had that be a standalone project that then became uh, an Apache project. 
Um, so there's a button, Calcite, you know, it has, it has the query optimizer, but it has the ability to ingest queries from, or, or parse SQL statements from all, you know, Postgres, MySQL, a bunch of different dialects. Um, and then Orca is another one of these uh, optimizers as a service that came out of uh, Greenplum, which was bought by Pivotal, which is then I think has been bought by VMware, which has been bought by Broadcom, uh, I think, yeah. But this is open source. This is, this is less common than Calcite. But Greenplum built this originally because they wouldn't have, there's the Greenplum, you know, data warehouse system they were building that's a fork of Postgres. But then they had another system, I think called Hawk, with a Q, that was like Hive, was like SQL on top of Hadoop. And so instead of having to build two separate query optimizers for the two different database systems, they, they put everything into to one. As far as I know, nobody uses Orca other than the Greenplum guys. But I think this, this, is the one, this is the one part of the systems I'm most interested in right now in terms of research. The other cool thing that's happened in 10 years is that there are now these universal or open source file formats that we can use across different database systems. So, so until maybe 10 years ago, most databases either had their own proprietary binary format, right? Think of like, you know, in your bus top project, uh, you know, when you write out a file, it writes out a, a .db file. Or do we rename it a .bus top yet or no? It's still .db, right? I'm assuming. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, the bus top has its own proprietary format that only bus top knows how to use, right? Uh, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, they all have their own proprietary format. But if you want to start sharing data across different systems, again, thinking in, in the cloud, I have you know, my, my front end applications writing some data I want to put out to S3, and then I want to have something else consume that. I could either store it as all JSON or text fields or CSVs, which would be very inefficient, but maybe if, if I have a file format that's like a cl columnar uh, binary encoding with compression, if I could have the application write that out, then any, my data, any data system I use can then read that. So there's a bunch of these file formats that are uh, make it easier to, to access data generated from one application and, and shared across other systems. So the most famous one of these is, is Parquet. Uh, this one came out of Claire and Twitter. Um, the next most famous one is Orc, which came out of Facebook. Um, these are, again, they're basically the column structure stuff we talked about before. But now they have a bunch of libraries written in whatever query language you, or sorry, whatever programming language you want, Rust, C++, Java, Python, uh, that you can then read and write these files in. So again, I can have my application generate these files and then, without having to talk to the database system, and the database system can then know how to parse them. Carbon data is at a Huawei. That's a fork of Parquet. Um, we did some experimentation on this, and it doesn't work. Um, at least the open source one doesn't work. Uh, Apache Iceberg is Parquet files, but additional um, uh, keeping track of additional metadata, so you can do incremental updates and do schema changes. Whereas Parquet files are like you know sort of write once, read many, but this can keep track of those things for you. Um, but this came out of Netflix. This is another good example. Netflix is not a database company. They're not making money selling you a database system, but they wrote Iceberg and they open sourced it, um, and a lot of people have, have picked up it and started using it. Uh, HD5 is not very common in sort of in our world in database systems, but this is a, a, an array format that's common in high, high performance computing, like scientific computing, so like all the, sci the, the satellite images or the telescope stuff, that usually is written in HD5. And then uh, Apache Arrow is a in-memory columnar format that allow you to do data exchange between uh, applications running in memory. So think of it like, like, like when DuckDB, when they read a file in, and then you want to query it, get that data in your pandas code. Uh, instead of having a proprietary format, if it puts it in the Apache Arrow format, now pandas can just read that memory directly without having to write to disk or write to a uh, own disk format and parsing it and bringing it back in. Yes? Why are these all called Apache? Why, why are they all Apache? Yeah. What is that? Oh, what is Apache? Yeah. Oh, uh, his question is, what is it, what, why are they all called Apache? Um, so there are the, 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 uh, is the Apache Computing Foundation is this, Nonprofit open source uh, compute, open source software foundation initiative. Think of like if I want to have like an independent person control the. It's a license, right? uh, no, there's the Apache license that came from the, but there's also the Apache Computing Foundation. It's even more confusing because also there's Apache Web Server. We'll get that. It's all the same organization, but it's basically there's. there's Apache is one of them. There's also like the Linux Computing Foundation. There's a the Cloud Computing Foundation. They're basically these nonprofit consortiums that allow you to have like a governance, bo a, a governing body for the, the for open source software. 
So even though like Netflix wrote Iceberg, people may, may want to say, oh, I want to use this software, but I don't want Netflix to be in charge of it, right? Because then like think of like Netflix, Netflix's competitor wants to start using the software and Netflix starts getting weird about it, right? Like, so you, by, 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 you donate the software to this consortium, the foundation, and then they have control of it. Um, so that's why, yeah, you'll see Apache in front of things. Yeah, yes? In a similar vein, why does Apache continue to maintain five of them instead of saying, all right, Orc sucks, everybody who's used Iceberg now or something, right? Like, His question is, why does Apache continue to maintain five of these um, instead of just picking one winner? Um, because that's not the model of Apache. It's not, it's not a company where like somebody up above is making decisions about what's going to succeed or not. There's, there's criteria you have to have about getting your software to be part of the Apache Foundation. But then, and then you have to elect like leaders to like be like you know, who controls the commits and, and testing and how you vote for things and keep, you know, there's a bunch of like bureaucracy stuff that they provide. But they don't choose who, like who can win or not. Things get deprecated, certainly. Things like you can become like a, a top ranked or top uh, top level project in Apache, but then if nobody uses it, then it gets relegated. Um, actually, Jignesh, I was building a database in Wisconsin called QuickStep, and it was it was an incubation process for Apache, but then it didn't go anywhere, and then it got it got killed off. Yes. Uh, suppose someone may, you know puts puts this out open source, but they don't put out the surrounding system that they built around it. What motivates the outside world to use? Yeah, his question is, his statement is, and it's a good question, is if someone makes an open source file format, but then there's no software to access it, what's the use of it? It's useless. Who cares, right? Uh, and so, like, for Parquet, for example, for, for these, an ORC, like, there is, there is an, a database system that is the Parquet database system. Instead, they provide you low-level libraries, like in Rust, to then parse the data and do some basic manipulation of it. Right? And then you build a larger system around it, potentially using the components that I talked about before. Right? Yes? To what extent is it difficult to assemble components? I imagine they've all been developed independently without thinking about the other bricks in the system. Yes. It sounds like it would be a headache. Yeah, his question is, uh, how hard is it to, to cobble these components together if they were all in implemented independently? How, do you, how would you actually be able to put them together? Uh, so there's like the... One, this is, this is what we'll cover in 721, but Apache Arrow ha helps a lot of this because now I can send data between the services in a universal format, but there's a bunch of other semantics about what it thinks things should look like or what, you know, what does it mean to be a query or what a query looks like that may be different from one of these components versus another. Um, I would say that uh, it's no different than having different abstraction layers in your data system that we talked about before. It's just now that it may be the case that you don't have full control over this one component. If you want to not do a hard fork of, of, of like you know, of, of Parquet, even though Parquet does some things that you think are wrong, uh, you just have to live with it. Actually, a good example was a few years ago we had the the founders of Blazing Blazing SQL. They came and give a talk, and they 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 had their own proprietary storage format, uh, but because everyone. And they were, they were running a data system on GPUs, but everyone was coming to them saying, I have my data in, in it's going to be an Arrow format. They then had to drop their own proprietary format and switch to Arrow, even though they felt theirs was better. So, like, you, you have to make sacrifices. Yes? How flexible are the different file formats? Like, for example, let's say for main storage, you want to use Parquet, but for large intermediary results, you want to store stuff with Arrow because it's better for image. Is that doable? Yeah, people, people do this all the time. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I mean, DuckDB does this, right? Databricks does this. Databricks will, it'll read any of these file formats, but then they're going to, when they bring it into memory, they put it into their own format. And then, you know, when it, when it spits out the result to you, then they'll put it back in Parquet or whatever, right? Yeah, we have a paper. Oh, I'll have to cut this. We have a paper that just came out of VODB. It basically shows, like, Parquet and Orchid were designed 10 years ago. Uh, and it, you know the hardware has changed significantly. The, the bunch of design decisions that they make is a is a is a bad idea. Okay, let's finish up. Uh, execution engines again. Thing of like the things you had to build in BusTub. There's now libraries uh, that you can download and use. Velox is from Facebook. Data Fusion I think is from the Apache Arrow guys and InfluxDB. And then this Intel thing OAP 
I don't think anybody uses this. These are going to be the two bigger ones. And then th this is what, what, what we're going to play with in, um, in, uh, in 721. Okay? All right. So uh, the main takeaways from all this, the cloud has definitely made distributed databases uh, for OLAP systems way more common than they used to be. And I think the byproduct of just having online applications, the internet, you get more data very quickly. Right? It doesn't take that much work anyway, anymore to like write an application that can take, to also take a lot of users and start scaling up and getting a lot of new data. Um, and so there's a lot of, lot of vendors in this space, a lot of VC money. Some of it's dying down uh, in, in focusing on vector databases. Um, but there's still a lot, a lot of problems to be solved in, the, in this space. All right, so again, uh, next class will be the, uh, the single source speaker. That'll be on Zoom. As I post on Piazza, just go to that Zoom link. And then if you want, uh, we can come watch it in my office. And if we, if we run out of space, we can spill it to the database lab. OK? Any questions? Yes? No, no, go, go, sit in your house, in your bathtub, whatever you want to do. I don't care. <laughs> yes? Uh, with all these open source components, is there like a consortium like IEEE standards or something to agree on these interfaces? His question is, is there a is there, is there a uh, like an IEEE standard to 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 specify what though? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, like you have your you want say uh, your output format to be a specific thing. Like if you take for example like uh, CPU architectures or something, you you have these companies agree oh, on the output that you want to support and things like that. Right? So in that uh, Okay, for the things that are outside the system, like that, that go outside the internal, you know, the internals of the system, it's going to be typically arrow, right? That's that's the that's the lingua de franca for communicating, exchanging data between different services. But as I was saying, that's just like in, for the encoding. There's the semantics about what's actually in there that could change. Okay, all right, hit it. <laughs> this shit is gangsta. Boys are gangsta. Yeah, ain't nothing but gangsta. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.